and we'll continue our discussion of devising role-playing game monsters. You can take two types of monsters and have them cooperate. Now keep in mind the phrase, which is certainly true, there's hardly thing, anything original under the sun. But combinations of things can provide new experiences and it can surprise. We see this kind of cooperation whenever a monster type is said to normally employ a different monster type as guards. Of course, powerful monsters may enslave entire groups of weaker monsters, and those weaker monsters can nonetheless provide good interference when the heroes show up. We can also take the characteristics from two monster types and combine them into one, and there's a classic uh, line of these, the owl, bear, shimmera, griffin, dragon turtles, and so forth. You can take normally unintelligent monsters and provide them with human intelligence, or normally intelligent monsters that aren't intelligent. Now, some combinations may not be very believable, and I like the believability in games and try to avoid them, but in this age of TV and movie silliness, not too many people care. The standards have changed over the past 50 years. So you can do things that would have been laughed out of the building, so to speak, 50 years ago, which now most people will shrug at and accept. Another way to make monsters interesting is misdirection. Play on the expectations of the players. Change the appearance of the monster. Pretend to be another monster. Change the stats, although it's easy to overdo that. So I try to avoid just changing the stats of an existing monster. There are worse things than killing you. They d monsters don't have to kill to be frightening. They can turn your bones to rubber. The rust monster eats equipment. There can be permanent level drain. Uh, you can be captured. Slavers are monsters too. Theft. Lost. Lots of monsters nick your items, such as leprechauns. There are lots of things you can think of that are not death, but will frighten the players, threaten them, their well-being, their possessions. Foreshadowing is something else you can do, and you can do this with any monster. You can have clues signaling danger, tracks, sounds. It helps foster fear of the unknown, even if it may provide some information. If they're intelligent monsters, maybe you'll find something in writing that sort of foreshadows that these guys are around, whoever they are. Really smart enemies. Face it. Face it. Classic movie enemies are often dumb. This is why the Evil Overlord list of vows exists. And if you haven't read the Evil Overlord list, I strongly recommend that you do so. I provide a URL here, or you can just look for Evil Overlord in a search online and you'll find it. Keep in mind also, even relatively dim monsters can be cunning. The great boxer Muhammad Ali was often said to be a dim-brained man, but he was a cunning boxer. Consider, though, you have to put your brain into the monster preparation. If you're not trying to be smart, how can the monsters be smart? Time pressure is the classic video game way to make monsters more dangerous. There's just not enough time. But you can do this in tabletop games as well. Time stress leads to mistakes. Watch out, it's going to blow up. Or the enemy has diverted water into a room that's filling up and you're trapped there. Or there's a fire spreading. Or the monster itself has some time limit associated with it. There are all kinds of ways to implement time pressure. Even if you're playing strictly on a turn basis, you know there are only so many turns before something happens, you still have time pressure. Positioning is another thing you can do with any monster. The classic is that you have a balcony and that protects otherwise wimpy archers because they're up there and you're down here on the floor or on the ground. Simple barricades, very low ceilings for short monsters. You're going after Duergar or somebody like that, dwarves. And they've kept their ceilings low so that humans have to bend down and consequently are much less effective in every way and especially in a fight. 
burrows of monsters can be hard to move around in. Water barriers can make a big difference. You can think of lots of ways to do this, but you have to think of it. It's not just going to happen. You can have societies or factions or groups where the group as a whole may be more effective than the sum of its individual parts. I've often found that a group of monsters, even if individually weak, is more effective than one powerful monster, especially if they're subordinate to a, a leader that organizes them, a commander or a mastermind. And I believe this is the last one, relentless hordes. Sheer numbers can be terrifying, even if the monsters are individually weak. The Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition minions rule is quite brilliantly simple in this connection. Any damage kills a minion. But you can have lots of them, and they're easy to keep track of, because either they're doing fine or they're dead. Now, relentless hordes are the opposite of the video game boss syndrome, where you have an often lone monster that's super tough. But try it. You may find it interesting. Now remember, depending on the game type, monsters have a somewhat different purpose. To scare if it's tabletop, or to kill if it's a video game, or kill it first. But surprise is the key to interesting monster encounters.